Hi, lovely people. So, as I said, we'll come up with a new format. We're still working on it and it might take some time probably. So, in the meantime, let's not waste our time and try to cover as many questions as possible in the same format which we started. So, I'm assuring you we'll come up with that new format as soon as possible. Fine? So, in this video, let's discuss the next set of 10 questions starting with gypsum overheating. So, when you heat gypsum, gypsum bonded investments or a gypsum more than 700 degrees centigrade there can be large amount of contraction or shrinkage with release of sulfur dioxide contaminating casting alloys so we have a very important information given in literature we'll just go through it now so as i mentioned gypsum bonded investments when heated in fact slight expansion takes place between 400 and approximately 700 degrees centigrade and there can be large contraction beyond 700 degrees centigrade this large shrinkage is most likely caused by decomposition and release of sulfur dioxide as we discussed previously. This decomposition not only causes shrinkage but also contaminates the castings with sulfides of non-noble alloying elements like silver and copper. Thus, it is imperative that gypsum investments should not be heated above 700 degrees centigrade. I hope it's clear. Now let's move on to the next one, maxillary sinus opening. In fact, we have discussed in detail lateral wall of nose in YouTube as well as in our e-classes. Very, very important and often. In fact, I guess we had uh, two questions from maxillary sinus. One is the volume of sinus and the second is the opening of maxillary sinus, isn't it? So where does it open? Middle meatus, hiatus, semilunaris. So, seems to be familiar names, isn't it? So, if you look into the literature, maxillary sinus drains into middle meatus by means of semilunaris hiatus or hiatus semilunaris as you can see in the image. In fact, there were several studies in order to identify its precise location. In one of the studies, it's mentioned that the ostium of maxillary sinus was more commonly found to open in the posterior third of infundibulum. Anyways, just keep in mind that it opens in middle meatus through hiatus semilunaris. Now moving on to the next topic, hepatitis B prophylaxis. I guess there is a question on the same topic in Ains uh, November exam as well. So we have some valid authentic information given in CDC website, Center for Disease Control, which you can see now. So you can see guidelines for post-exposure prophylaxis of persons with non-occupational exposures to blood or body fluids that contain blood by exposure type and vaccination status. You can clearly see how to treat unvaccinated person and how to treat a previously vaccinated person if in a case they're having a needle prick injury from a potential source of hepatitis B. So it's all given in detail here. Just make a note of this table or just take a picture and save it in your archive. So HVS AG positive source, if that's the source of exposure. In case of unvaccinated person, you have to go for administering hepatitis B vaccine series and hepatitis B immunoglobulin, HBIG. In case of previously vaccinated person, administer hepatitis B vaccine booster dose. So likewise, depending upon the exposure, so what to do in case of un un unvaccinated person and in previously vaccinated person, the protocol is quite clear. So just go through this table, you'll uh, find all the relevant information, right? Now moving on to the next one. HIV virus concentration in various body fluids. In fact, we have several articles and several studies based on the same. And I'll give you one reference. HIV has been identified in various body fluids, but it is especially highly concentrated in blood, uh, sexual fluids like semen, vaginal fluids, and in breast milk. Although HIV is present in saliva, tears, sweat, urine, etc., the concentration of the virus in these fluids, in these fluids in the sense saliva, tears, sweat and urine. The concentration of the virus in these fluids is very low and transmission is unlikely. So based on the options given, I think you can choose the more appropriate one. Now coming to cingulum rest shape. So cingulum rest or lingual rest, semilunar shaped. So as you can see in the image, it's placed on the lingual surface of a tooth, especially in a maxillary canine and the shape is semilunar. In fact, we discussed about rests and rest seat preparation. And also we had a question on rest seat angulation, isn't it? Compared to the minor connector. We'll discuss that briefly now. So before that, 
another question on all strains of AA are susceptible to each of the following antibiotics. So when reviewing uh, lots of literature, I found out a few relevant points pertaining to this topic. Doxycycline is more effective than combination of amox and metronidazole to treat AA homotypic biofilms according to one reference and the other reference clearly states that azithromycin is highly effective in vitro against AA. Almost all 79 strains were inhibited at a concentration of 2 micrograms per ml. So azithromycin is effective against all strains of AA according to other reference. So let me know if at all there are any additional options given. We'll update them in, a, in the description part of this video. Right? Now moving on to the next one, RPI. We had a live session on the same last year and we discussed in detail about the concept of RPI, rest proximal plate and I bar. So what's the mode of retention? See, in case of circumferential clasp, it is pull type retention, whereas in case of I bar, it is push type retention. So just look at the image and see how it actually works. It's very easy to visualize. So RPI, rest proximal plate, I bar, the bar type clasp is said to have push type of retention while the circumferential class is said to have pull type of retention in brief about the mode of retention and then coming to angle between occlusal rest and minor connector it has to be less than 90 as you can see in the image we have discussed the same in our e-classes as well the angle formed by the occlusal rest and the vertical minor connector from which it originates should be less than 90 degrees so that the forces Masticatory forces will be directed along the long axis of the tooth, right? I hope it's evident in the image as well. Now moving on to the penultimate topic, what should be the minimum degree of encirclement? In fact, encirclement, it's one of the principles which is incorporated while designing a clasp. So according to that encirclement principle, it's a property of the clasp assembly to encompass more than 180 degrees of the abutment tooth either by continuous or broken contact to prevent dislodgement during function. So each clasp must encircle more than 180 degrees of abutment tooth. So this based on this encirclement uh, mode, we have continuous contact as in case of circumferential clasp or a broken contact as in case of bar clasp, right? So the same you can even find the image, right? 180 degree encirclement provided by retained arm, rest as well as reciprocal arm. Now coming to the final topic, your favorite I guess, cusp of carabelli. We all know that it's found in case of uh, maxillary first permanent molar on the mesopalatal or mesolingual cusp. But I have some interesting literature to share, so I'll just go through that now. The cusp of carabelli, also known as carabelli tubercle, maybe based on the size, is tuberculum anomaly of George Carabelli. It was first described in 1842 by Hungarian scientist George Carabelli. This is a morphological variation which takes the form of fifth cusp or it can grade down to a series of grooves, depressions or pits on the mesial portion of lingual surface. This cusp is found lingual to mesolingual cusp of maxillary first permanent molar as you all are evident and aware of which is the largest of well developed cusps. So mesopalatal as you know is the largest cusp and this carabelli is found on lingual aspect of this mesopalatal cusp and it becomes less prominent in case of second and third molar. It, it is present but it becomes less prominent. The etiology is unknown but it is suggested that cusp of carabelli might be due to overactivity of dental lamina. A genetic and exogenous factor seems to have an influence on the formation of this cusp. The incidence of this cusp is more in maxillary permanent first molar and rarely seen in case of primary maxillary second molar and the presentation is usually bilateral the frequency of occurrence is reported to be high in europeans than in asians and males are more affected than females with a predilection ratio of 1.2 is to 1 so this is something interesting which i found uh, from one article so i wanted to share the same with you right so these are some of the topics which i wanted to highlight in this specific video so we'll continue with this format uh, until the new format is ready. So in that new format, as I said, we'll try to uh, provide you the bulk of the questions in limited time possible. So it's a challenge, we'll definitely do it.
So I hope it's clear. Wish you all the best. Love you all.